Hello, welcome to Church Online. I'm Dave, operations producer on our digital team here at Grace Chapel. I work with our team creating all the video content we show for both our online and in-person services, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. I just have to tell you though, I don't think I've been on this side of the camera since about 2010, so it's been a while. If you're new here, or even new-ish, we'd love to hear from you. Click the link on the video description or go to grace.org slash hello online and we'll send you a gift card for a cup of coffee. But whether you're new here or regular to our online community, I'd like to give you a moment to greet everyone else joining us here today. If you're watching with your family or friends, turn and say hello, or just leave a note on the YouTube chat. If you're watching this on a smart TV, just pull out your phone and leave a note with your mobile device. And if you aren't with anyone right now, you could also just send a text to someone you think could use a hello from you today. I'll put a countdown up and we'll be right back in a minute. I hope you were able to make a real human connection during that moment. And I'd like to give a big happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and spiritual mothers joining us here today. We are so thankful for you and we celebrate you. This morning, our message is from Tim Galley, pastor of Group Life and the architect of The Gathering here at Grace. I hope his message leaves you inspired and challenged. And as we move into our time of worship together, I invite you to read and proclaim these words from Psalm 100 with me. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship you today. I pray that each person joining us today would feel your presence as we worship and seek you together. I thank you for the mothers we celebrate today, for the tremendous love and sacrifice they give to their children. I also ask that you comfort those who find Mother's Day painful, those who have lost mothers, mothers who've lost children, and women who have found themselves unable to be the kind of mother that they'd hoped to be. May your love and peace surround them all today. Lord, would you meet each person who's joining us here today? And would the love you displayed for us on the cross flow out from each of us into the world? Amen.
Years ago, I led a series of student mission trips to rebuild New Orleans after the destruction from Hurricane Katrina. We focus on the town right next to New Orleans called Chalmette. Now, the story of Chalmette, Louisiana, is that when the levees broke, this town was flooded just as badly as the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. But because it was on the other side of the New Orleans city line, Chalmette did not receive the same type of federal funding and rebuilding assistance as their neighbor New Orleans did. Same devastation, but that imaginary line made all the difference. We were among the thousands of people who responded despite our limited repair skills. And among the sad scenes that I will never forget is that nagging question of looking around and asking myself, why bother rebuilding this place? I mean, what if it floods again? And why move back here? There were many people who took the FEMA payments and, and moved to Baton Rouge or out of the state altogether. Why return to Chalmette? In the part of town that we were in, they had closed seven of the eight elementary schools. They closed most of the post offices and there was no longer a hospital. There was no movie theater. Most of the stores had left except for like two Home Depots and two Lowe's. We were in this neighborhood where there were only eight of the 52 homes inhabited. And on the street that we were on, there would only be one set of lights on when we would leave for the day. Why move back? Why rebuild? Throughout our time serving there, people would offer an answer. They would say things like, this is our home. This, this is our community. It's hard to see it now, but this is our future. Now, hopefully for most of us, we haven't had to rebuild like that. But I've had access to people's stories for over 20 years of ministry. And I've seen people having to rebuild all sorts of things, like, like their careers, or having to rebuild or repair their marriages, their family life, their reputation or credibility, or their hope for the future. Churches have had to rebuild following some sort of falling out or, or some sort of failing. Companies have had to rebuild following some sort of downturn, and on and on it goes. These days, we all find ourselves in some form of need to rebuild certain aspects of our lives, and that's what I want to talk about today. This week at Grace Chapel, each of our campuses has its own unique message for their congregations. And I'm grateful that Pastor Leah has asked me to speak to you today. If we haven't met, I'm Tim Galley. I serve in group life. I'm on the teaching team. And, and I serve at our new gathering service, which is our new Sunday night service in Wilmington, led by next generation leaders. And we're also trying to create a space for some of the complicated conversations that we don't have regularly in our church circles. So consider yourself invited. But here, we are very grateful for this online community that has been forming over the past couple of years. I want to know, we, we talk about you and we think about you often. We pray for you and for this community. And as it comes to Sunday, I've, I've been doing my best to prayerfully listen to what God might have me say to you today. Can I let you in on the process a little bit? I prayed on it for a bit, wondering what I should say and and then I felt that I was ready for an answer from the Lord. Last week, I could, I could feel that, that Sunday was coming, and, and I wanted to prepare well. And I was like, Lord, I'm ready for the answer of what we should talk about. And probably like many of you have experienced, I, I didn't really get the lightning bolts or that thunderous voice from heaven. Behold, Timothy, this is what I would have you say to my people. I didn't get that. I then took out the Bible, the Word of God, and, and hoping that the Lord would speak to me through Scripture. I'm reading the Bible in the year again this year with, with a group called Limu Deem. It's not too late to join us, by the way. And we were just wrapping up 2 Kings, and, and this plan has us going into Isaiah now. And I, I felt like I was talking myself into about a dozen possible sermon texts for this sermon, but I didn't have any clarity or direction. Then sometime later, when I wasn't thinking about it, I was staring out, and I saw this beat-up parking lot and all these construction vehicles that appear to be rebuilding on really this ordinary lot. And they were going to have to repair and build and repave and fix up the place. It, it was a mess. They had a lot of work to do. 
And I thought to myself, is this worth it? What are they rebuilding? Is it worth it? Clearly, they believed it was. I'm a pastor type, so everything around me is kind of spiritual for me. And I was in a tired and cranky mood a little bit, to be tr totally truthful. And I don't like to make decisions when I'm in that place. But I was, I mean, I was ready the other day when I was prayed up and the scriptures were all open in front of me. But, but this scene prompted me to take out my phone and open up my Bible app and, and find the Bible reading plan that I was in again. And, and I remember that this plan does not always go in the order of the, 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 the table of contents of the Bible. This, this, this Bible plan actually skips. And one of the books that they skipped was Nehemiah. You can't skip Nehemiah. That book holds such a special place for many of us. And among the reasons is that it is a story of the next generation of the children of Israel returning home to Jerusalem, finding their beloved country and city in ruins, and long story short, they have to rebuild. And as I read, and as I got to the second chapter where there, the people were mocking them and ridiculing them for their efforts, and I imagine the scoffers asking, is it worth it? Well, the book of Nehemiah adamantly answers, yes, it is. I'm going to give you some context here. The Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah are companions to each other. They're accounts of the very same story. Ezra was the priest and Nehemiah was the appointed governor of Judea, appointed by the Persian uh, king uh, Artaxerxes, or Emperor Arti, as I'm sure his friends called him. Now, many of us love the book of Nehemiah because it's about a man on a mission, calling his people to rebuild with inspired speeches. But there's also some drama going on because he has political rivals, including the one guy named, named Sanibelt, which is who is undermining him at every turn. And there's also a fear of being physically attacked by invaders, literally, as they're in the midst of rebuilding their city as they're rebuilding their lives, as they're trying to rebuild their future. Now, there are all sorts of parallels for us to draw from in the, in the wisdom of scriptures. But before we do, let's read and consider the text a bit more. Chapter 2 opens up very dramatically. And it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was being brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and, in the, and the gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. Now, Nehemiah has obviously found favor with his king to the extent that the king cares about his feelings. Nehemiah is faithful with the opportunity he seizes and he, and he asks for these, these letters uh, in the following verses. But these aren't ordinary letters, okay? These are letters from the king and they function like, like a blank check and building permits. And literally, one of these letters gives him a private army for protection and safe passage. And when his political rivals heard about this, they were angry. The text continues. It says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and the gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God that is on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let's start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. But when Sanibel, the, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the Amorite official, and Gishon, 
the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this that you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you will have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the setup, we love Nehemiah's heart and his dream to, to see his ancestor city rebuilt. So you can really appreciate the story. So you can really appreciate the story. Let, let me give you a little bit of history. Anyone here like history? I see that hand. Some of you also don't like too much history. Okay, I'll keep this tight and short, okay? I promise. 539 BC is also known as Cyrus's Edict. And that's what returns the children of Israel back to Israel. So the exile is about 70 years long, okay? And Nehemiah shows up about 445 BC. So about 100 years after that edict. And he's not born in Israel. In fact, his own parents may not have also been born in Israel. It's possible that it was his grandparents that last stepped foot in Israel, or perhaps his parents were young children when, when they were forced into captivity and exile. Now, there are many factors to appreciate in this story, and among them are all the unknowns that Nehemiah has to deal with. Nehemiah does not know firsthand what the old reality was for his people. Nehemiah also does not know what the new reality is going to be either. What Nehemiah does know is that he has been called to rebuild. And maybe you can relate to that. All those unknowns. Everywhere you turn, there is a headline or a voice on a screen or, or a personality on social media that is telling us that we don't know what the future holds. Often, this creates a bit of anxiety for us. War in the Ukraine, a polluted and suffering planet, economic instability, and challenges in our own personal lives, and on and on and on. In the church, we wonder, what's next for Jesus' followers? Church attendance in America is declining. People are rethinking what they actually believe and, and how they want to live. And you might be asking the very same questions and more. There are so many unknowns. Can we pause here for a second? It is good and needed that you ask all the questions in all their many forms. I believe so strongly that God is not afraid of our questions. So questions like, do I really believe this? And what do I really believe? That and more are among the questions you should be asking. Often people have a hard time admitting to a pastor, I hate to say this, but I'm not really sure if I believe anymore or what I believe anymore. I think that statement is made by those who leave the faith and I also believe that that statement is made by the saints of God and everyone in between. I would encourage you to prayerfully ask and, and even wrestle with those questions in prayer with the Lord. I firmly believe that that's where understanding comes from, where wisdom is found, where truth and love and belonging is found. But it starts with an act of faith and the courage it takes to wrestle with that unknown. Further, if you're feeling a sense of sadness, it's okay to not feel okay. Did you catch that in Nehemiah? His heart is burdened. He is sad and he is longing for a reality that he has never actually experienced. And what he is saying to the king is borderline insulting. He's pretty much saying, although I'm a cupbearer in your kingdom, I wish I could live somewhere else. That's why it's an act of faith to admit this for him. And the king, who by all accounts is not religious and like most ancient rulers is quick to kill and, and you know, if, if he doesn't like his answer, not only are they going to be looking for a new cupbearer, but, but Nehemiah is not going to make it. But he says, Nehemiah, what do you want? And I'm really stunned by the scene because the name Nehemiah means God who comforts. So when the king says, God who comforts, what do you want? What a powerful spiritual moment that must have been. Long story short, Nehemiah wants to rebuild his forefather's city, 
rebuild his true community and rebuild their future. And first, he needs to rebuild this wall. I ask you today, and this really becomes the crux of the message, what needs rebuilding in your life? Chances are it's a multiple set of things, but what needs rebuilding in your life? Another pause in the hopes of saying things the, the way I feel led to say them today. Um, also, in somewhat of a reaction to the way that things have been said to me. Here's what I mean. You're watching this on an, on an online space, and there's an assortment of reasons for that. Among them is that for some, it is physically safer for you to worship from home. We respect and appreciate that and celebrate that. You keep doing what you're doing. For some of you, it's, it's because you're in a spiritual place where you want to stay connected to your faith, but church is a trickier topic for you. So an online service offering you provides some opportunity for worship and teaching without some of the things that you're trying to avoid. That too, we appreciate and respect. Can I speak into that just a little bit? I love Jesus like all of you. I really do. And I want to become more and more like Jesus. And I, and I love the local church. But that is a more complicated love because it's filled with people and people are complicated and broken. And I am complicated and broken. And we all need Jesus. And as one who is both a preacher and, and also one who, who listens to a lot of sermons and who has listened to a lot of sermons since childhood, I know as a preacher what I'm supposed to do right now at this juncture in Nehemiah 2. I'm supposed to say, just as God has called Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem, God is calling you to build his kingdom. And that's all true. And I actually like those sermons. And it's one of my prayers. But I don't want to just motivate you today. Today, I, I, I want to ask you to, to reflect. My ask for this message and in this space is, in, is to invite you to take inventory, to be reflective, and to ask God to help you become as self-aware as you can and ask God what needs rebuilding or building in me or around me. And as you do, I want to show you something else in the text. And that is to highlight some of the voices who are mocking and ridiculing Nehemiah. I don't even want to quote them again, nor do I want to mention their names and, 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 and what Nehemiah is doing, the work of God that God is calling him to, these guys are mocking him and they're playing dirty. And what they say and what they imply is all secondary, really. But I say this to warn you, that you will have opposition to whatever it is that God is calling you to rebuild or to build. So beware the cynics. Beware the critics. Some of them are failed builders themselves. And if they can't rebuild it, they definitely don't want you to succeed. For some, they, they gain by seeing your life remain in ruins. And for some, they are just stuck. Afraid and believing that something great can be done again. Afraid to get their hopes up, just to be disappointed again. Beware the cynics. Also, beware arguably the most dangerous of cynics. The one inside you. That voice that says, why bother rebuilding? The voice that says, who are you fooling? You can't do this. The one that brings up all of your past failures and reminds you of your shame and all of your pain. Friends, the book of Nehemiah tells us that there is a greater future. A beautiful and redemptive hope awaits. And here's one of my favorite parts of the story. According to Nehemiah 6.15, they rebuilt the wall in just 52 days because God was with them. Despite the political opposition, despite the threat of invaders, despite their lack of rebuilding skills and whatever else that disadvantaged them, God empowered them to rebuild that wall in 52 days. And once they had fortified their city, Nehemiah 8 tells us that with the priest Ezra, they worshiped and read scripture and feasted. And then they started to rebuild their own homes and they rebuilt their city infrastructure and their community and their future. And they depended on the Lord to do all that. Similarly, whatever the Lord has called us to build, 
we must rely on God's strength to do so. So I ask you again, what needs rebuilding in your life? What if you took the next 52 days and reflected on that question and prayed to the Lord who, who builds out of the ruins and creates all things new, beautiful and strong? What needs rebuilding in my life? Do you need to rebuild your spiritually formative practices and habits again? Prayer, meditation, the reading and application of scripture. Ask the Lord for strength to rebuild. Do you need to rebuild a, a set of relationships? For, for some of us, we've survived COVID-19, but some of our most special and long-held relationships have suffered. Can you ask God for the strength to rebuild these bonds? Do you need to rebuild your place in the church? Is God calling you to help build this online community? Maybe you'll join a virtual group down the road, or maybe you'll feel led to start one. Maybe it's a combination of practical actions, but will you be a builder of the church? And let me pause here. I would love to encourage you to reach out to Pastor Leah Knight, Breton, or to Pastor Brian, or even to me if I could be of any help. But we know that we want to hear from you and connect with you and help you in any way that we can in this online space. Also, do you need to rebuild your hope in the future again. Not the future that pop culture or news media outlets keep talking about. I'm talking about the future that God is calling us to. Can we rebuild our hope in the future that God is, is directing us towards? And I want to emphasize this. It is essential as followers of Jesus that we receive Jesus' teaching on this one whenever we talk about rebuilding. It says in, the te in, in, in Matthew, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Friends, we must be dependent on the teachings and on the way of Jesus and on the power of the Holy Spirit. May we not build on the sands of the world, but on the rock of God, with the power of God, for the will of God. And what if, and I, I mean this, what if some of the greatest things that are about to be built and rebuilt are, are in front of us and God is calling us to them? It strikes me that Nehemiah never knew what the original wall of Jerusalem looked like. And so he was not bound in recreating something old or something out of tradition. Instead, he and his people got to rebuild what was truly needed for their day, for their context, for themselves, and for their future. God was leading them towards that. I believe with all my heart that God is calling us to rebuild for now and for our future similarly. Only it may not be walls and structures, but, but maybe it's to build our devotion, to rebuild relationships, or to re rebuild pathways to reconciliation, pathways to justice and redemption and love. Maybe to build and execute the vision of God for a true love, leading us to these glorious and Christ-needed things in our midst, in our world, in our homes, in order that all things might flourish. Friends, we are so grateful that you are a part of this online community. We're so grateful for all the ways that you've been participating. And we invite you to consider this morning, what is God asking you to rebuild? Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so thankful for, for the gift of Scripture. We're grateful, Lord, for how you speak speaking throughout these words and throughout these stories and throughout the history and how you speak to us right now. And so, Lord, we ask that, that you'd bring clarity to us, that you'd bring perspective to our hearts, and that we would have the courage to follow whatever it is that you are calling us to. Because those questions linger, is it worth rebuilding? And we pray, Lord, that we'd find our confidence and our hope in you and that you would help us to rebuild the things that you want us to rebuild. 
in our lives, and for your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today. How about that band? Before I let you go, there are three things I want to tell you about. First, join us for FLE or the Financial Learning Experience. It's a two hour personal finance event taking place on Sunday, May 22nd, and it's free. We'll put a link in the description for you to check it out. Second, next week we are starting our new sermon series, The Good and Beautiful Life. In this series, we'll be exploring the life of Jesus and the early church. We'd love it if you would join us. If you come back, you'll get to see a cool animated bumper video our team is creating out of the series graphic. And third, if you'd like to help us as our online campus takes shape, whether it's leading a group or a more interactive worship experience, or something else we can experiment with as we explore how to discover life with God for the good of the world in this online space, we would love to connect with you. Shoot me an email or fill out the connection card at the bottom of the page at grace.org online. Thanks for joining us this week and go in peace.